Welcome everybody to another exciting Woo You event. This is a topic that has been very requested over and over multiple times. So I'm really, really excited about tonight's event. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu. I am your host for the evening, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event. I do wanna say thank you so much to Regenerize for supporting this event with an unrestricted educational grant. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elise Kramer. Dr. Kramer is a residency trained optometrist in Miami, Florida, and she specializes in ocular surface disease and regular and specialty contact lens fitting. Her doctorate was from the optometry school from the University of Montreal. And then she completed her internship in ocular disease at the eye centers of South Florida. Then she went on to complete her residency at the Miami VA Medical Center. After her residency, Dr. Kramer became a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society, and she now serves as the public education chair elect for the Scleral Lens Society. She's published several important articles and reviews and participates in clinical research trials. She is the proud owner of the Miami Contact Lens Institute and Weston Contact Lens Institute. On top of her accolades, Dr. Kramer is a dear friend of mine, and she is a huge inspiration in the optometric world. I know that I am incredibly excited to learn from her this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer, for, for joining us, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here on Wu University and being able to share my experience and knowledge in dry eye. Um, so thank you so much for having me. You can see here my financial disclosures. And we'll start right away by jumping into what I think is, is probably one of the most important things that happen in dry eye, which is the TFOS dues um, to study. And um, you can actually find that summary pretty easily online. One of the most important things from this uh, study was the definition that came out of dry eye, which is that dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological etil roles. So I think this is such an important definition because I think this is the first time that it was referred to as a loss of homeostasis. Uh, and that's gonna be key when we talk about treatment. And obviously this entire webinar and course is gonna be about treating dry eye with a focus on eye drops and prescription eye drops. But it's important to understand what we're trying to accomplish when we have a treatment. And the, what's key in dry eye is we are trying to restore that homeostasis. And it's important to understand as well in dry eye, what is causing that loss of homeostasis. And we'll see here that there are a lot of different causes. So I think this is one of the most important flow charts that you can find again in the TFOS2 study, which what it does is it allows you to kind of con um, attack dry eye when you have a patient presenting with either symptoms, signs, or both, and know what direction to go in. So if we start on the left-hand side, let's say we have a presenting patient, they're asymptomatic, um, they have no signs, they're probably normal, right? So if, if you do have a patient that just is not complaining, there's nothing wrong, don't go further than that. But if you have an asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic patient, but you see that there are signs and you're thinking something maybe neurotrophic, or you might think that maybe these people might develop symptoms if they undergo some sort of ocular surface stress, like let's say um, a surgery, like cataract surgery, for example. So that's something that you might wanna treat if you are referring this patient out. And obviously there's differential tests that you can do to determine if your patient is neurotrophic, which is beyond the scope of this course, but it's definitely important and we can talk about it later. So if you have a patient that's symptomatic though, but they don't have signs, then you're thinking, okay, 
they may have neuropathic pain. And this is important because the treatment there might actually be for pain management and not for ocular surface disease management. But if you have a symptomatic patient with signs, then you have to determine what type of dry eye it is. And we'll go in and, and discuss these different types of dry eye. And then we can talk about what the different treatments are based on the type of dry eye you have. And obviously, if you have symptoms without signs yet, other than being neuropathic, it can also be someone that is in a preclinical state. So basically that the signs are not visible yet, but that they may appear later on. So that's an important differentiation as well. Dry eye disease can either be aqueous deficient, evaporative, or it can be a mixture of both. So again, these treatments are all based on management to restore homeostasis, and that's key. But it's really important to identify is it evaporative? Is it aqueous? And then it's easier to determine what the treatment is. And of course, sometimes it can be mixed and we'll go through that as well. So if we look here, we can see on the left-hand side, ADDE, which is aqueous deficient dry eye. And on the right side is EDE, which is evaporative dry eye. And you can see the cycle is the same. Either way, you're having evaporation of the tears. The only difference is that on evaporative dry eye side, you have excessive evaporation. On the ADDE side, you still have evaporation, but it's normal. What's causing the inflammation in this case is just a low flow. So you have quantity on the left and quality on the right. Again, it can be mixed, but you can see here that the cycle is the same. Either way, you have release of all these inflammatory cytokines, you have inflammation and the dry eye cycle, if not treated, can actually just keep going round and round. So what's important to know here is again, how to differentiate between EDE, ADDE, because the treatments are very different and also whether there's a mixture of both. So let's start with evaporative dry eye, okay? So evaporative dry eye syndrome, is related to MGD, which is meibomian gland dysfunction. It can also be blink related. So incomplete blink, for example, those can all both cause excessive evaporation of the tears. And those are lid related. You can also have it be ocular surface related if it's caused by mucin and introducing a contact lens is like introducing a foreign body in that area. So it can actually exacerbate or even cause excessive evaporation of the tear film. So again, is this age related? So we discussed this also in a tfos do study. Um, it's possible, we know that 78 to 86% of all dry eye disease is going to be in older people, but we're seeing younger and younger people developing meibomian gland dysfunction as well as, you know, aqueous deficient dry eye as well. Um, the symptoms that you have are itching, burning, watering, redness, thicken my bum, and this will cause as well an increase in superficial punctate keratitis. You will see a decrease in tear film breakup time. That's one of the key diagnostic tools that you can easily do at your slit lamp. And what happens is that the my bum in my bum and gland dysfunction will cause a decrease in terpenoids which will cause an increase in protein, which will cause thicker secretions, and then you can get a plugging of the gland. So this is what plugging of glands looks like. This is called the toothpaste sign, and you really will see this in your meibomian gland dysfunction patient. The way to look for this is to do meibomian gland expression. There's two ways of doing this. So I'm more of the bottom type where I like to squeeze and see what comes out. Um, so you, again, you can do this with your finger, or you can use what's called a meibomian gland evaluator, which is a special device that's used to express the glands. This is personal preference. I don't think there's one that's better than the other. I, again, I, I do the bottom technique a little bit more, um, but you can certainly do either one. And another very important test in uh, looking for evaporative dry eye or meibomian gland dysfunction is my bombing gland imaging. And this is something has, that has become an extremely important part of 
my dry eye practice. So if I have a patient that's using eye drops or that is complaining of dryness, whether it's at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, I will do mybography. Mybography has existed for a very long time, actually used to be done using the transillumination technique, which you can see on the top right, which is basically just taking a transilluminator and putting it at the bottom lid. You can actually visualize the glands that way. But a lot of tests have come out. They're mostly of um, infra, uh, infrared testing. Uh, so you can see up there the, the, the lipis scan, uh, the MyBox, which is something I use also in one of my offices, the Oculus Keratograph. All of these are very, very useful tools. And I compare this a lot to dentistry. So when we go to the dentist's office, they show us kind of a, a, a very large picture of our cavities or what's going on in our mouth and showing patients their meibomian gland dysfunction is one way that I have converted or, or shown patients that they do in fact have dry eye and presented the treatment. And I think that's important. It's important for patients to understand, um, you know, where their dry eye is coming from. And imaging is just really, really key. And also something very impressive that you can show your patients. Another important thing in blepharitis or meibomian gland dysfunction is the biofilm. So biofilm is an accumulation of bacteria on the eyelid margin. And this is called lid margin disease. This does contribute to meibomian gland dysfunction and will play a role as well. So lid hygiene is something, and we'll get to treatments uh, in a bit, but lid hygiene is something that is very essential in evaporative dry eye. Okay, so let's talk about treatment and management. So education is probably one of the most important things you can do. So again, showing patients their images and then recommending different things that they can do. So home treatment is something that is key, whether you are doing something in the office or not. So eye drops, and we'll get to eye drops, of course, but lid hygiene and warm compresses is essential omega-3 as well help with inflammation. So I think out of all of these, in, in terms of my bulimia gland dysfunction, um, the warm compress is probably the number one treatment. What we're doing here is liquefying the mybum or the oil in the bulimia glands and allowing that oil to come out. So we're unplugging the glands and then indirectly helping with what's causing excessive evaporation. Obviously artificial tears, are going to be very important as well and we'll discuss them in detail out of different treatments that you can do in the office so all of these are great um, you certainly don't need to do all of them but i offer a couple of these so you can see the mybo flow on the top left the lipo flow on the top right ipl on the bottom right and then tear care on the bottom left so all of these are doing the same thing um, they are heating up the meibomian glands um, in, a, in a way that's a lot more effective and more heat and more local heat than a warm compress. And for example, Lipoflow will do pulsation, tear care is followed by manual expression, and IPL is something that causes um, heat to, directly to the glands, allowing them to unplug. So all of these are great treatments and things that you can do in your office in order to help patients with evaporative dry eye. Now, another culprit that I can't go without mentioning is obviously Demodex. This is something real that you, the real way of, of, of catching this is gonna be with a microscope, but you can have a clinical suspicion and probably even see this with a slit lamp um, if you see sleeving at the base of the lashes. The treatment here is gonna be a tea tree oil uh, tea tree oil has terpene, terpenin for all, which is toxic to Demodex. So this is really important. And actually doing lid hygiene with some of the standard blepharitis, so anterior blepharitis wipes, will kill bacteria, which indirectly will kill um, the Demodex because the Demodex will feed off of that biofilm in order to survive. So you can indirectly kill them with just regular wipes that have acid, uh, hypochlorous acid, or you can use something with tea tree oil to just get rid of them directly. But this is something that you see in, in older patients, especially, but even in younger patients, it's pretty prevalent. So definitely uh, keep on your mind. All right. 
So let's talk about artificial tears. So artificial tears are considered a first line therapy for dry eye, where, whether we're talking about evaporative dry eye or aqueous deficient. So we started with evaporative dry eye. Let's stay on that uh, subject for a little bit. So artificial tears for my bulimic gland dysfunction, for evaporative dry eye, for this I it's always better to use something that has a lipid. So what you're trying to do here is improve tear film lipid quality, okay? By managing my bulimic gland dysfunction using lipid-based artificial tear supplements. So these will have mineral oils, phospholipids, some of them have castor oil, okay? And what they're doing is they're designed to improve tear stability and reduce tear evaporation by supplementing deficiencies in the natural tear lipids. So these are some examples, okay? So these are gonna be formulated as emulsions, and that's important. The emulsions contain lipids, which help prevent evaporation of the tears. So that's really what you're trying to do here is help prevent evaporation in, in addition to all the other treatments that you're doing. So when I have a patient uh, that has evaporative dry eye, this is everything that I'm doing. So th the thing about dry eyes, you can't just do one thing. The patient has to do some things, you have to do some things, and these things have to be continued. So lid hygiene, okay, artificial tears, blinking exercises, which we'll go through in a minute, supplements, so we talked about omega-3, contact lens instructions, if applicable. So if your patient is wearing contact lenses, we need to discuss um, how and when to wear these in a safe way, not to increase evaporation or exacerbate evaporative dry eye. Warm compresses, uh, prescription medications, which we will get to, sleep masks. So this is interesting. This is wearing at night to minimize airflow, especially for patients who have like a fan or ventilator above their bed. So this will help the 20-20-20 rule. I think everyone's recommending that to their patients these days. So this is every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break and look 20 feet away. And this is such a key thing, especially now everyone's on Zoom working from home on their computer screen. So I think everyone should do this, but especially someone with evaporative dry eye. So let's go through blinking exercises. So this helps kind of like the muscle memory in your eyelids, but it also helps, you know, get that mybum out, uh, basically allow those mybomian glands to, to do their function. So closing um, the eyelids so that they touch. It's really surprising, but a lot of people only blink partially and blinking partially will uh, cause excessive evaporation. So it's kind of to remind patients that they have to blink all the way, squeeze down, and then open up their eyes again. And this is recommended to be done 10 times in a row. So I think this is super important and definitely important, especially if you're doing one of those in-office treatments in order to maintain the effect of those treatments, because a lot of them are done once or twice a year. And obviously the patient is doing treatments at home, but in order to kind of follow that those treatments through blinking exercises are really key. Okay, so moving on to aqueous deficient dry eyes. So this, the most common cause is going to be inflammatory infiltration of the lacrimal gland. So obviously completely different etiology. I mentioned that you can have mixed, so you can have a little bit of one and the other, but I'm separating them so you guys understand the difference. It can be very severe in Sjogren's syndrome, less severe in non Sjogren syndrome. Um, and it's inflammation that causes both acinar and ductal epithelial cell dysfunction or destruction, epithelial injury and defective glycocalyx, loss of tear volume, a goblet cell mucin, which leads to increased frictional damage and friction related symptoms. Again, causing tear hyperosmolarity and epithelial injury caused by dry eye disease, which stimulates nerve endings. So when you have your nerve endings that are stimulated, this is causing discomfort, increased blink rate, uh, compensatory reflex, increased lacrimal secretion. So a lot of these patients are complaining of just excessive tearing, pain, burning. So a lot of the symptoms are similar, but again, the etiology is completely different. So I love this test. I do it on every single patient. 
that I suspect has aqueous deficient dry eye. Obviously, you can also do it on your evaporative patients. This is just something I use a little bit more for my aqueous patients because I want to determine how severe they are. For me, it's important to do that because I want to find, do they have Sjogren's syndrome or not? And a lot of them that are more severe, you can actually help diagnose um, Sjogren's syndrome. So there are a couple questionnaires you can offer. You can even offer both. I know some practitioners who do both. There's, so this is the OSDI. There's also the speed test. Um, recommend doing at least one, but you can certainly offer both. And it gives you kind of a score, an idea how severe it is. I like this test personally, because there's a color code at the bottom, which helps the patient understand, you know, where they are on this ladder. And of course, it depends how many questions they answer and how bad their symptoms are. So it, it's a really straightforward test, which helps you quantify how much dry eye is bothering the patients. Another thing that is key for aqueous deficient dry eye is using lysamine green. So with lysamine green, what we can really do is highlight those dead and devitalized conjunctival cells. And it, it is sometimes just this bad. And you won't see it um, sometimes if you just use fluorescein. So um, lysamine green is something that is really, really key in a dry eye practice, not just to um, look at conjunctival irritation or, or um, you know, uh, dead and devitalized cells, but also lid wiper epitheliopathy. And for your contact lens patients, lid wiper epitheliopathy is something that you will see if they have dry eye. And there's a lot of studies about lid wiper epitheliopathy which show that the more you have or the, the more stain you have on the lid wiper, the more symptoms they have, the worse dry eye they have. And obviously this may not be causal, but it's definitely indicative. And it definitely indicates that they probably have a lot of friction between their eyelid and the ocular surface, which, which obviously can increase inflammation. Of course, fluorescein. Uh, so fluorescein will highlight conjunctival, but especially corneal dead and devitalized cells. And so you can see these sandpaper corneas. These are very, very, very painful um, for our patients. And this is a, a patient of mine that I saw, um, couple, I think a year and a half ago, that was referred to me for dry eye. And you can see just how dry that surface is and it's begging for treatment. So again, this is something that we just need to use vital dyes in order to see um, a lot of the damage that's been done. And also to monitor our treatments because you can take photos and just see how your treatments are working if you do this. So other things for aqueous deficient dry eye. So again, these tests are completely different from evaporative dry eye. So it's, it's so important to ask questions and do these tests so that you can find out what type of dry eye your patient does have. So you can see on the bottom, the show test, which is done with the patient's blood samples and sent to a lab in order to determine whether they have Sjogren's syndrome. It's it's a helpful um, diagnostic test. Um, honestly, the real way to diagnose Sjogren's syndrome is, is with a salivary gland biopsy, but this is definitely helpful. And then you can see the Schirmer's test, which we all know about on the bottom, um, the inflammatory test on the top right, and then uh, the phenol red thread test, which is kind of like the Schirmer's test, but different. So in Schirmer's uh, test, what we're trying to do is see if we get less than 10 millimeters of tears, then we know. And you can see how they're measuring it there with the ruler. If they have less than 10, it's, it's, they, they may have moderate to severe dry eye. Um, and same thing on the phenol red thread test if they have less than 15. Um, inflammatory dry again is kind of like a pregnancy test. So it just gives you a positive negative result. If you have a dry eye will be positive or if there's an excessive amount of inflammation on the ocular surface. Okay, so artificial tears. Um, so again, this is considered a first line therapy for dry eye, whether it's evaporative or whether it is aqueous deficient 
but these tiers are different than the other tiers that we talked about. So these actually aim to increase tear volume, minimize desiccation, and lubricate the ocular surface. So not so much to do with evaporation, but help with tear volume is what we're doing. So increasing viscosity, lubricity, retention time, and adhesion to the ocular surface. So these have inorganic ions like uh, sodium chloride, and they may have electrolytes as well, which are found in normal tears. So additionally, what they're doing is they're acting to replace one of the actions of the mucin component of the tears. So common use polymers in these artificial tears are gonna be like pollen vinyl alcohols, which have surfactant properties to stabilize the tear film or longer periods. Semi-synthetic cellulose, so you guys have probably heard of methyl cellulose or hydroxymethyl cellulose or hydroxycellulose. Hyaluronic acid, which have greater retention time, and these also improve uh, tear film stability. So there are some tears that have other ingredients. This one has glycerin, but patients really love this drop. Um, it's kind of a newer drop on the market. And also you can have combinations. So there are some tiers that have several active ingredients. This one has three or four, um, and it's called Fresh Coat. So you use polyvinyl alcohol, um, which mimics the mucin layer. And also it has a povidone at 2%, which mimics a lipid layer. And this one also provides high oncotic pressure, which can be used for those patients that, that just have a very, very high level of hyperosmolarity on their ocular surface. So this one has a lot of different active ingredients, which um, many patients actually really like and find helpful. Another thing for aqueous deficient dry eye that can work really well, especially again, for those people who might have incomplete closure um, at bedtime. So are gel. So these are more viscous, they have longer retention times, and usually the, the ingredients are polyacrylic acid, petroleum. So these are mineral oil-based ointments. Um, again, these are reserved for nocturnal use uh, because they do blur vision and they can sometimes make the eyes feel really sticky. Again, these are gonna be for patients who have lag ophthalmos, incomplete closure, uh, again, when they're sleeping, or blink paralysis. So all great products that you can use in your aqueous deficient patients. So one thing, and I remember when I first discovered the TFOS do study, um, I, I just completely changed all my dro the drops in my office to preservative free. Now, this is a recommendation. Obviously you guys can do what you feel is right, but I just think that all preservative free, all, all I, artificial tears, and gels should be preservative free. Some preservatives are a lot more toxic than others. For example, BAK is a lot more toxic than Purite, for example. But I just think that if we're treating ocular surface disease, we all know that preservatives can exacerbate that. We've seen it on our patients that use glaucoma drops excessively. Um, and obviously these are not optional, but why introduce another set of preservatives? So. I really am adamant about preservative-free artificial tears. Again, this is a personal preference, but this is something that I, I really strongly recommend to my patients. So um, many eye drops, even if they are preserved, they should be thrown away after 28 days. Um, some newer eye drops can be kept for up to six months though. Um, but check, you know, so every drop has a different, uh, you know, throw away, especially if it's preservative-free. Um, and a lot of these drops come with leaflets inside, so you can read about the specific drops that you're recommending to your patients. And of course, drops should not be shared um, from one patient to another or between family members. So that's really important too. Punctal occlusion is something that uh, I think should be done on everyone with aqueous deficient dry eye. So you can't just do this because it, again, the quality of the ocular surface has to be improved, but artificial tears and punctal occlusion is really the mainstay of treatment. So occlude increasing the tear volume, but also using artificial tears to help, um, you know, replenish that ocular surface and increase the quality of the tears and, and the volume of the tears on the ocular surface. So, 
obviously one treatment that I do a lot and, and Dr. Wu does a lot as well. Um, and for those of you who, who fit specialty lenses, this is a really great option. Um, so scleral lenses um, are indicated for severe ocular surface disease. So you can see the 70 year old white female with severe SPK who came in for a scleral lens evaluation. So what's, what's interesting about a scleral lens is that it's sitting on the ocular surface um, the entire time, obviously that it's formed, creating an oasis, right? It's creating this oasis on the ocular surface and it, it will neutralize a regular astigmatism if you have that, but what it does do in ocular surface disease, it provides a tear film reservoir. And that tear film reservoir, when the lens is fitted properly, will stay on the ocular surface the entire time that the lens is worn until it's removed. And it's great because you can actually, you don't have to fill that with saline solution. You can fill it with preservative-free artificial tears. You can fill it with autologous serum tears, which we'll get to in a little bit. You can fill it with anything that's preservative-free and you can create a cocktail that works for your patient. And a lot of these patients are extremely thankful to have these. So you can see, for example, that same patient, uh, look how much better the ocular surface is after wearing a scleral lens for a few weeks. So just like a bandage, just like a, a, a ocular surface improvement using a scleral lens. So a great option as well. And you can definitely use your art preservative free drops um, and artificial tears inside the bowl of the lens before putting it on. So now let's get to the real part of this course, which is let's talk about um, prescription drops for dry eye. So before we do that, we have to understand a little bit more about inflammation. So this is the ocular surface. You can see this in this video. What we have in, in an ocular surface that's inflamed or in dry eye, we have an increased expression of several inflammatory markers. So you can see ICAN there, which is intracellular uh, adhesion molecule one and the hum human leukocyte antigen. So what happens is that these cells inter or these, these inflammatory uh, uh, antigens will basically interact with T cells and these, they will activate T cells. So you have these antigen presenting cells which will activate uh, these T cells and just uh, cause a release of inflammatory cytokines. And these inflammatory cytokines is what causes all of the symptoms that our patients are feeling. So uh, cyclosporin is something that came out a while back. So this is an immunosuppressive agent. Um, it's used for treating inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, like psoriasis, and what it does is it reduces the, uh, the amount of inflammatory markers, okay? And after six months of treatment, there's actually an increase in the number of goblet cells on the conjunctiva, and it may result in increase in goblet cell differentiation. So the first one to come out was restasis. Now we have CEQA as well, which is a higher concentration. The exact mechanism of either one is not known. Okay, but what, what we know is that can help increase the eye's natural tear production, help restore tear production at, by acting as a partial immunomodulator. And what's cool about CEQA and what's different about it than Restasis is it has what's called N-cell technology. So N-cell technology is something, it's a vehicle that basically enhances delivery of the cyclosporin to the ocular surface because it has a hydrophobic pore, which prevents the encapsulated cyclosporin, which has poor aqueous solubility from being released until after penetrating the ocular surface. And the hydrophilic shell, which allows for transport through the tear film. Now we all know how complex the tear film cornea um, is, and that's why a lot of things don't penetrate well. So this supposedly does penetrate a lot better and can release the active ingredient once it's penetrated the ocular surface. So there's been a lot of studies showing good results with this drop. Again, N-cell technology is something that it has. So lafitograss is something else. Um, it's a different ingredient. What it does is it blocks LFA on T-cells 
from binding to ICAM. And ICAM, as I showed you in that earlier inflammation video, is overexpressed on the ocular surface and dry eye. So it may prevent formation of an immunologic synapse based on in vitro studies, which helps inhibit T cell activation. So if you inhibit T cell activation, then you're inhibiting basically cytokine release. And if you inhibit cytokine release, you're reducing symptoms. So that's the idea of, of lipidograss and how it works. So again, different mechanism of action than cyclosporin, but also um, great for inflammation. Steroids. So in general, steroids are off-label um, for uh, dry eye. They reportedly have a positive influence on dry eye because they reduce inflammation, right? And we know that now we know that inflammation is a key aspect of dry eye. We know that they're more efficacious than NSAIDs and they de de decrease um, in HLA DR positive cells and symptom severity. So I said they're off label, but now actually we have a new uh, drop on the market, which is ISUVIS, which is, has been approved for dry eye flares. And this is cool because 80% of patients with dry eye suffer flares and 45% of patients with dry eye report primarily having flares. So this is a great job to use short term for those patients that have dry eyes. And again, this is FDA approved, so not off label uh, for dry eye. Let's talk about Regenerize. So Regenerize is one of my new uh, favorite drops. So it's derived from multiple allogenic proteins, peregrine signaling, which is basically DMAPs. Um, but what's important about that is, is basically it contains a lot of ingredients that help regenerate the ocular surface. So let's see how this works a little bit. So again, these are called DMAPs. And this acellular approach um, may help regenerate the ocular surface. Again, Regenerize has a lot of ingredients. So let's talk about fatty acid binding protein for a second. So this is a novel diagnostic marker of diseases associated with dry eye, like Sjogren syndrome. It um, helps maintain the ocular surface epithelial barrier and trans epithelial water transport and decreases leads to barrier disturbance, increased tear evaporation and dry eyes. So it, the amount of fatty acid binding protein in tears is really, really important. And we know that Regenerize has fatty acid binding protein. So this actually has high levels, which may regulate the transepithelial water transport, support uh, tear stability and prevent ocular surface epithelial damage. Also helps with dryness, grittiness, scratchiness, soreness. Um, and it's a drop that honestly, I've started using in my practice recently, but I've had such good results with. Um, so you can see all these active ingredients on the left, vas va vascular endothelial growth factor, epithelial growth factor, platelet factor. So all these growth factors that are there stimulating the regeneration of the ocular surface. And honestly, honestly, I heard of this drop uh, from a patient of mine. And this patient, um, we'll hear it from her in a minute, but honestly, she is at, swears by Regenerize. She loves Regenerize. And I'm so happy that she agreed to make this video for us because it's because of her that honestly, I introduced this drop in my practice. And it has been amazing for so many of my severe dry eye patients. So let's hear what she had to say. Hi, welcome to Dr. Kramer's seminar about dry eye. My name is Anna Zakopaiko and I have Stevens Johnson syndrome. I was diagnosed when I was 35 back in 2015 and I'm currently 41 years old. You would never know by looking at me that I suffer tremendously from ocular surface disease, but I do. I have been treated in Washington State, Boston, as well as Florida, where I currently reside. I have tried everything to help my dry eyes, and um, it's basically come down to a mixture of dry eye cocktails, as you all know, being in the industry yourself. One of the most advanced medicines I have found is Regenerize, and I would like to take a few moments to let you know how this drop has transformed my life. 
I used to be dependent on Procara. I have probably worn eight membranes, including the Procara Super and the Procara Slim, to which one time my eye actually ate the Procara ring, which is dangerous for your patient, unlike the Regenerize drop. This drop is a 30, excuse me, this bottle is a 30 day supply and it contains about 34 drops. Each night, my partner puts a drop into my eye where my dry is thoroughly coated with an amniotic solution over my bull bar and my palpal brow. As the Regenerize actually helps my palpal brow and my bull bar. This drop works as a primer for my eye. It makes it so my eye is more stabilized. After I receive this drop, my eye feels extremely dehydrated and I wait 15 minutes, and then my partner applies my dry eye cocktail. For me, that is a combination of Lodamax ointment and preservative-free soothe. Since using the Regenerize, I've noticed that my eyes suffer still. However, they're more manageable. I can't speak for everyone with ocular surface disease, but I can tell you about my eyes and what Regenerize has helped me with. Regenerize has helped my blepharitis. I, brief, I briefly got off the Regenerize because I had a back fusion and I couldn't put anything in my eyes for 18 days, including my prosthesis. Dr. Kramer fit me for beautiful iPrint Pro prosthesis, 20 millimeters. I had my head wrapped for 18 days. There had to be something that could change because the general anesthesia and the pain medication that was required for the surgery was wreaking havoc on my eyes. I cannot take any pharmaceuticals, including Tylenol. The only thing that makes my eye feel better is the Regenerize. It's the only thing that doesn't give me the downtime. It's the only medicine that does not hurt my eyes. Now I do have to tell you, when you are dispensing this to your patients, it will burn. It does feel a lot like a loofah, but your eyes calm down after you put the ointment in. And moreover, when you wake up in the morning, your eyes are more stable, giving you hope for the day. Regenerize is hope for your patients. I know some patients will be detoured by the cost of the drop. However, one drop will make your patient a believer. I tell all of my friends with Stevens Johnson syndrome in my support group to use Regenerize. Nobody believes me. I'm telling you one drop and your patients will be a believer. I hope that when you're treating your patients, you understand how debilitating and isolating dry eye can make a person and how misunderstood ocular surface diseases and that Regenerize is a step in the right direction. Regenerize is hope. Regenerize is future. Regenerize can keep your patients out of wearing prosthesis. Regenerize may not be my final step. However, when there is something new that comes along, I feel confident knowing my eyes are the most secure they can be because I use Regenerize and they will be ready for the next medicine. Thank you for your time. And I appreciate everything you do for the dry eye community. Yeah, so she definitely has severe, severe dry eyes. This is a patient that comes in with uh, moisture chamber goggles. Uh, this is someone who can't open the fridge without um, having severe pain uh, from the cold air. So someone very, very symptomatic. And she's the one who got me on board with the drop and I'm very thankful to her. So let's talk about autologous serum tears. So 20 to 50% um, have been used safely and effectively. So this drop contains albumin, also has epithelial growth factor, fibronectin, vitamin A. Vitamin A is important because it's essential for maintenance of a healthy differentiated ocular surface. Also have other neurotrophic growth factor, hepatocyte growth factor. Um, and basically the, the treatment is related to up uh, regulation of mitochondrial acids. It assists in maintaining healthy and stable tear film. And basically it preliminary studies suggest that it acts to suppress apoptosis in both corneal and conjunctival epithelium. One of the concerns of this is just contamination. So it's important to follow guidelines on when, how they should be stored and obviously when they should be discarded. So basically the way that this drop is, is done is by drawing blood and it is centrifuged uh, in, in this device here. And so this obviously allows to separate the blood into serum. And the only part of 
the blood that is used for the drop is the serum, which is the yellow part that you can see on the top. And so this is made into the drops and obviously only this unique patient can use the drops and they have to be refrigerated. So this is something also that is very, very useful and has a ton of growth factor that can help regenerate the ocular surface. So in summary, I know we went over a lot of different treatments and a lot of different drops that have a lot of different mechanisms of action in the way that they help um, the ocular surface. But I think one thing, and I said this at the beginning, is identifying the underlying cause. There are so many different uh, causes for dry eye. It's important to figure out if your patient it has evaporative if they have aqueous deficient or a combination of both. Um, follow up. So this is how I follow up my patients. Obviously, there's no rule. This is just a guideline that I have. Um, if they're mild, I'll see them every eight to 12 months, moderate every four to six months. And if they're severe, I see them every one to three months, especially if they're having, and sometimes weekly, if they're having a flare up. So I have some patients who come back every week for treatments in the office, and also just to make sure that we're getting their ocular surface under control. Um, I think another thing again, that I can't say enough, super important is preservative free. Obviously, this is an opinion of mine, but I just find that, you know, preservatives do compromise the ocular surface. And if we're trying to, you know, treat ocular surface disease, just preservative free is the way to go. Um, and then cocktails. So as my patient alluded to, but also um, you guys know, like just mixing different drops, obviously not using them all at the same time, but giving your patients several different treatments and indicating them why and how to use each different drop is important. Again, if you are using a scleral lens, you can fill the bowl of the lens with a lot of these, uh, make a cocktail and then put the lens on. So, um, this is just one of the basic, basic things for dry eye. And I think that your patients would benefit um, from a lot of these different drops and use the right way. So with that, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And thank you for being here with me tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed. Oh my gosh, that was so amazing. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. I can tell how much work you put into it, all the different videos. Oh my gosh, I, I was like, did you create some, some of the little cartoony ones? I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know where you found these things or uh, <laughs> like figured out where to find these, but what a great comprehensive review of all the eye drops on the market. And like you said, there's so many to choose from. And it's really hard sometimes, even as a doctor, you know, especially somebody that, you know, I used to live in a rural area, I would never see a rep or very, very few times. So I wouldn't even know what drops were even available on the market. So this was such an incredible, comprehensive overview of, of everything.